Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Buka Insights Podcast, where we bring you insights on investing, entrepreneurship, and a growth mindset. Today, I have a special guest. Uh, he is in the energy space, uh, works for a very large research company that is very involved in the energy space, and he is none other than Kelvin Sam. Welcome to the show, Kelvin. Hello. Yeah. So, Kelvin, maybe some um, warmer questions or appetizer questions. What was a 15-year-old Kelvin like? <laughs> Yeah, I think I was pretty quiet. I'm the quiet sort, always reading. So yeah, didn't definitely not the extroverted sort. I see. What what were you reading about? What were your favorite genres actually? Oh, I think I like reading about storybooks and and uh yeah, in general, uh fantasy stuff. Fantasy stuff. Okay, yes. okay, great. Um, what actually got you um into the energy space was it was it by chance was it by happenstance or was it an engineered and planned entry into this uh, space actually yeah i think it was by chance so i studied business and when i graduated i did a job doing equities research so back then i'm based in singapore so back then i was covering singapore listed oil fuel service companies and they were involved in uh, FPSO construction, you're involved in rig building. So the Singapore listed companies uh, also also include uh, some of the asset owners as well, FPSO owners. And so as a sales side analyst, you have to wake up very early. At, uh, you have to wake up before the sun rises at 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m. sometimes. So I changed jobs. I ended up doing FPSO market research. I've been doing that for the last 10 years. So kind of like... Um... In Malay, uh, there's a phrase, it says, tak kenal, maka tak I don't know if you've you heard of this before. <laughs> if, it's even, if you never knew it, then you never fell in love with it. So I guess you fell in love with the FPSO market because you stayed ever since, you know, you covered equity research. What makes it so interesting as compared to the other industries you don't mind sharing? Yeah, it's a very, it's a very stable market in the sense that when even when oil prices are very low you don't see fpso contracts being cancelled if you own a fpso and you rent it out to oil company you get recurring income so not many industries can boast about having recurring income okay good so to most of the audience out there who are actually not familiar with the FPSO or even oil and gas industry. And if you're not familiar, do check out uh, the previous episode where I talked to you on it. Um, it's in the top right hand corner. But let's begin with the most basic premise of what is an FPSO and actually how does it function? Sure. FPSO stands for floating uh, production, storage, offloading vessel. It's basically a ship which processes oil and gas. So the oil produced from the FPSO is stored on the FPSO until it's ready to be offloaded for export. So with a FPSO, because it floats, you typically use it in a remote or deep water location to develop oil and gas. And it's important to note that FPSO is a fairly big market. There are 155 existing FPSOs out there and another 30 units under construction. And in a good year when oil prices are high, you can have oil companies ordering as many as 12 FPSOs in just one year. Wow. And perhaps uh, at this juncture, uh, are a lot of these uh, FPSOs only ordered in good times? Or is it like, uh, does the companies, um, how do I say, uh, what is the outlook of when they start ordering these FPSOs? Do they like usually order it in a five year plan and they know that they're going to develop this field? Or is it like every year there's already like a, a fixed cycle that? a minimum of one FPSO per. Uh, what's the criteria if you were to indulge us? <clears throat> yeah, so typically they will go through a process, a very staged process where they look at how viable the project is. Mm -hmm. uh, they do some drilling and if uh, the drilling confirms that there is sufficient oil, then they move the project to the next stage. Uh, they invest a little bit more money at the next stage where maybe they do a bit more engineering and they try to see how much uh, FPSO costs. Mm -hmm. And if they like 
the sort of prices that they're getting from suppliers, then they move on to the next stage where they may officially call for a tender. And after that, they would uh, look at uh, then after that, they will look at uh, uh, tendering the FPSO. And then when, when after they tender the FPSO, they uh, if they like the prices, then they may decide to move forward with the project. I see. I see. I mean, um, perhaps uh, you will obtain the picture of what the parties involved in the FPSO. So uh, maybe you start off with, let's just say, mainly uh, the international oil companies or national oil companies, right? And um, yeah, who, who are the players? Who is the client? Who is the supplier? And are there any middle guys involved, actually? Right. So when you need a car, you can usually choose whether you want to rent or buy a car. Mm -hmm. So similarly, oil companies such as uh, ExxonMobil, for ExxonMobil, we consider them an international oil company. Uh, for a national oil company, uh, like say the largest FPSO buyer in the world is the national oil company of Brazil, Petrobras. Mm -hmm. So when an oil company decides whether or not uh, they won, they, they, when they're looking at whether they want an FPSO, they can choose whether they want to buy or lease an FPSO. Mm -hmm. And when an uh, oil company develops an oil and gas fuel, uh, they're usually called the fuel operator or just operator for short. Okay. And companies which build the FPSO are normally called contractors. So shipyards in South Korea, China and Singapore are normally the contractors which will build the FPSOs. And you actually have some contractors who are even willing to build, own, and operate the FPSO for the oil company. We call such companies uh, leasing companies or just leases for short. Mm -hmm. So maybe some names to, to jog the uh, familiarity for the audience who are not in the industry. So probably you've got uh, a leaser, let's just say uh, one of the largest in the world is probably like Nordac or SPM, okay? So they're a leaser. Yes. And then to build that uh, FPSO, uh, they actually go to a fabrication yard, right? Uh, yes. Who are the players there? For the biggest FPSOs, most oil companies would go to a Korean shipyard. So there are three major Korean shipyards, uh, Samsung Heavy, uh, DSME and also Hyundai Heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for a conversion FPSO, typically uh, this would be done in Singapore mm -hmm. or in China. So some of the largest uh, Singapore conversion yards include uh, companies like Keppel or Samcorp Marine. In China, the largest FPSO conversion yard would be companies like uh, Costco. Okay. Yeah, so basically you have the new build companies, uh, which are mainly the Korean yards and also the conversion uh, yards like the Singapore and Chinese yards. I see. So yeah. why is it that maybe the Koreans don't want to do conversion as much? Is there less money to be made because of the conversions? I think it's mainly to do with their workflow. They're more focused on building ships. So it's very natural for them to do new builds. And uh, it's important to note that the Chinese yards are climbing up the learning curve very quickly. Mm. And uh, they are actually building many, many FPSOs right now. So they are basically uh, taking on more market share from the Korean yards over the last five years. Okay, so for Lisa, the our business model is to actually take on the uh, underwrite this project, so to say. So they will come up with financing. They will come up with the project management team. Our project management will get parties to be the lack of a better term, and then they would actually manage these yards. Am I correct? Manage these yards. Manage the projects. That's everything right. on behalf of the client who could be a Petrobras or, or any or whoever, right? The thesis is. So how is that actually? So, okay, once it's built, and then from then on, the ownership of the FPSO is taken back by the leaser to be delivered to the operator or the leaser. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. So yes. how is the revenue stream being generated? Because on one hand, uh, the fabrication yards need to be paid. So who comes up with the payment and all this? Is it the 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 FP the FPSO less lesser in this, this case? 
Right. So um, let's look at the big picture here. So FPSOs are typically purchase or lease. Okay. So if we are talking about purchase FPSOs, 60% uh, of all the FPSOs out there are purchased by the oil companies. The remaining 40% are lease. Okay. So when you purchase, when an oil company purchases an FPSO, they normally contract on a turnkey model where the contractor uh, is responsible for the entire process from engineering to procurement to construction. So the way it works is the contractor quotes a fixed price to the oil company okay. and the contractor is obligated to deliver the FPSO and somehow try to make money based on this price. So FPSO can cost anywhere from $200 million to up to $3 billion. So okay. these projects can be very big. So let's say a shipyard quotes a $3 billion price to the oil company to deliver FPSO. And it turns out that the FPSO costs $3.1 billion. Then in this mm -hmm. scenario, the shipyard is going to lose $100 million, which is mm -hmm. a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So from the oil company's perspective, uh, buying a FPSO is usually cheaper than leasing a FPSO if you're confident that you'll be using the FPSO for many years. Mm -hmm. So when a company leases a FPSO, in this scenario, uh, when an oil company leases a F, a FPSO, the lease contractor will promise to build, own, and operate the FPSO for the oil company. Mm -hmm. So typically, the FPSO lease contractor will only get paid only when the FPSO achieves first oil or when it starts producing oil. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually, they will get a fixed day rate from the oil company, which allows the contractor to recover their costs of building the FPSO while earning a profit. Okay. So that usually is um, how, how long is the payback period? So let's just say someone like SPM or even a Malaysian company like Gibson, when they undertake this leasing model, uh, there is a, there's a part of it where there is a construction profit, right? Um, my, my guess is, and then there's a part where they are paid a daily lease rate. And usually the daily release rate when, when they calculate their returns, right, is usually what's the payback period like? Seven years, 10 years, 15 years? Usually for a big FPSO, you're looking at seven years. Seven you get years. your capital cost back within seven years. Okay. And then five to seven years really depends on the size of the FPSO. Mm -hmm. So the smaller the FPSO, the faster the payback period. I see. Yes. So but will the construction profit uh, that is recognized probably right after the ship is delivered to site, uh, it, it, is the construction profit only paid after first oil or the construction profit is paid the moment it leaves the yard? So usually, let's let's say it's not a very big FPSO. Let's say the FPSO is uh, about a billion dollar FPSO. So usually, if a uh, oil company is leasing the FPSO from a certain company, mm -hmm. this company will only get paid only when the FPSO is producing first oil. In terms of cash flow, the cash flow only arrives when the FPSO is accepted and, and producing oil for the oil company. Okay, so that means there is not even a recognition of construction profit uh, prior to that. Oh, um, in depending on accounting standards, if the FPSO is uh, leased by the oil company, they would actually start recognizing construction profits. So I'm referring to cash flow here. I see. Where uh, cash flow, the cash flow only arrives usually only arrives after the FPSO is. Uh, producing oil, but in some cases, when the FPSO is very big, uh, let's say it's $1.5 billion, it's customary for the oil company to make a down payment, for some oil companies to make a down payment to the lease contractor. And, and in that case, they actually get some cash flow up, up front. Yeah, if not, they, the leaser have to bear all the working capital while in construction. Yes. Can't even recognize, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty heavy on the pockets. <laughs> Okay, um, since you, I, I'm going to roll back and ask two, uh, two more uh, clarifying questions. Uh, um, okay. So when you say size of SP, FPSO is big or small, um, would it be fair uh, to use, let's just say, the, the, the total FPSO cost as a, a, a determining factor to know whether it's big or small? Meaning anything below 5 billion US is small uh, or a billion US is small, anything above it is, is huge. It is, is that how normally the industry uh, 
it dominates the size of an asset. Yes, so I think broadly speaking, uh, if you just look at the capital expenditure, anything below 500 million is small. Uh, 500 million to $1 billion would be medium. Anything above $1 billion would be big. Okay, and very simply speaking, yeah. very simply speaking, have what's the smallest you've seen and what's the largest you've seen so far from your experience? <laughs> Wow, the smallest I've seen is this really small one that's below $200 million, but those are really rare. Yeah, really, the really fuel really life for the FPSO is uh, it, the, the FPSO is not expected to produce for many years, so we want to keep it cheap. I see. And usually, these are these uh, costs that you mentioned, these are purpose-built, new-built FPSOs rather than a conversion, right? It can be a new-built or a tanker conversion. Okay. Okay, and generally new builds are more expensive. Oh, obviously. Um, for a conversion, is the same ballpark range being used? That means anything below five hundred million. Can a conversion actually go up to three billion? I don't think so, right? Oh, it no. is like, like one billion is like ah yeah, don't even convert. I just build from scratch on you, right? <laughs> I think the most expensive uh, conversion I've ever seen is two billion. Yeah. What? Is was it because it was so old that they? It's, Oh no, it's mainly because of the oil process capacity and the top size weight. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at an FPSO that produces above 150,000 barrels per day, then you can, uh, that, that's when it usually starts, CAPEX usually starts going up to one point, uh, starts going above a billion dollars. Mm. Okay. Even but, if we're talking about a tanker conversion. Yeah, what would be the tipping point? I mean, is there like a tipping point to say that it's worth conversion or it's worth building new? Is there like a ballpark figure or a ballpark percentage to determine that actually? Yeah, I think most oil companies would look at the fuel life of the FPSO. I mean, if the FPSO is expected to, if they're confident that the FPSO will produce for 30 years, then it makes sense to go for a new build. Mm -hmm. And if they are, usually the, the tipping point is around 20 years. Okay, 20 years. Lah. Yeah. When, when you're confident that the FPSO is can go to 20 years, unless you want the FPSO really fast, you would go for a new build. Okay. Uh, tanker conversion would be uh, faster, but the drawback would be uh, less space for top size weight. And uh, you're, you're a bit worried about, you might be a bit worried about how long the how can last if you're converting it from existing tanker. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Especially now, I, I don't know what was the specific year, but most tankers in, in, in recent times, they have this double hull design and all that to prevent yes. leakages, right? So, yeah, if it's like a very old hull, I think uh, it won't even pass safety standards. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. Now, I'm going to ask a more, uh, let's say a 40,000, 50,000 feet view. So, if you were an international oil operator, national oil operator, and you are... I know there are many variables, but let's let's try to uh, see whether we can nail it down. Okay. I have a, a design that is, let's just say, for 500 meter or less water depth, okay? And then I have a competing design of a fixed structure platform versus that of an FPSO. How do you decide? I mean, um, I was involved in a lot of front-end studies before, and usually for Malaysian shallow waters, it's an FPSO is almost not in, not part of the design. This is like, but I wanted to because um, I built TLPs and 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 FPSs before, but for the FPSO, I've not been involved in an FPSO project. So, from your experience, what is the tipping point for fixed structures versus FPSO? What do you see are the main criteria that pushes or nudges these companies towards an FPSO? Yeah, usually it's water depth. So uh, FPSO is normally used to develop re remote or deep water oil and gas fuel. So once your water depth exceeds 400 meters, mm -hmm. uh, you're typically going to go with uh, FPSO. And because a fixed platform would be very expensive uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, once water depth exceeds 400 meters. So usually a fixed platform is a poor substitute for FPSO because they are usually meant, these two concepts are meant for very different projects. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other one that I wanted to ask, because like, um, like FPSO Kalang, so it's in Malaysian waters, very shallow. What actually prompted, you know, FPSO Kalang to operate in such a shallow water depth? Was it because was uh, the, the fuel life has, has uh, shortened it somewhat? That's why they rather have an FPSO or 
was it because of they wanted a faster turnaround time to produce? I mean, in those rare outlier cases where water death was not an issue, actually. Yeah, I'm not familiar about the example that you just mentioned, but in such cases, you may want to use a FPSO conversion, a tanker conversion, mm -hmm. if you want the FPSO very fast. Mm -hmm. So that in that scenario, even though it's a shallow water, it's near to shore, you may want to use a FPSO. If or, or if you already have a FPSO, then it might make sense to try to upgrade the FPSO and use it very quickly. Uh, to develop this oil field that is in shallow water. I see, I see. Um, in terms of um, timelines, uh, yes. let's just say a purpose build, let's, let's put certain equal parameters here. One billion um, capex costs between a conversion and a new build, right? Um, what, would be, what would be the timeline be? Let's say finalization or FID. Uh, uh, to actually first oil, what, what is the duration like actually for a new build versus a conversion? Okay, for a new build, uh, if you're from FID or contract award to first oil, usually looking at four to five years. Okay. For tanker conversion, if it's a very small tanker conversion, you can even get it done within two years. Wow, okay. half the time. Very, very small. Half the time. Half the time. Yes, so it really depends on the size of the unit. I see. I see. Yes. Uh, the other thing that uh, I wanted to clarify more is that in terms of um, financing risk related to conversion for a new build, will the financing be easier for a new build or will the financing be easier for a conversion? Or it doesn't matter at all whether it's a conversion or a new build for financing. Yeah, usually the banks will look past the fact whether if it's a new build conversion and they will look at the underlying field. So for them, they're very concerned about how how much about the reserve size or the break-even oil price of this overall project. They would want the break-even oil price to be as low as possible I see. Yeah, I see. before financing the FPSO. So that's something that they're very concerned about. I see, I see. Okay. Um. So back to the point about fixed and versus a floating, which is the FPSO. Um, have you seen uh, project concepts or project design that are like neck to neck, meaning to say either an FPS or a TLP versus an FPSO? And what actually brought the camera to actually push it towards FPSO from your experience? Yeah, usually it's so if you're talking about two deep water concepts, yeah, um, between TLP and FPSO, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, usually that would be. Uh, distance to shore, whether if there's a pipeline available, if there's a pipeline available nearby uh, where the, the oil company can just plug the unit into the pipeline, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, into the pipeline, then it may, makes sense not to use a FPSO but a TLP or a semi sub. Mm -hmm. But if there's no pipeline nearby, then it really makes sense to use a FPSO because you can just offload the oil from the FPSO into a shutter tanker for export. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, for those listeners who are not familiar, uh, I just wanted to highlight that there are actually many, many variables <laughs> rather than just cost. Uh, I mean, cost obviously is the, 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 the anchor to it, but more importantly is that are there existing facilities in place? There's a tie back that will reduce costs. Are they uh, probably like, um, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Shakalin LNG project in Russia. Yes. Yeah, the pipeline is like 800 kilometers all the way down, uh, purely because they can't even bring a tanker all the way up to to, to the platform. Yes. Yeah, so, but if that project were to have shuttle tankers minus the 800 kilometer pipeline, um, do you think that that would have been even been feasible? I mean, this is just a purely hypothetical question. Obviously, both you and I may not be intimately involved in that project, but what would have changed in your, in your perspective for that Shakli project? 800 kilometers, you know, purpose built just for Shakli, you know? <laughs> yeah, generally, if there's uh, no pipeline nearby, then it, it makes sense to use a FPSO for offloading into a shuttle tanker. But if there's a pipeline nearby, then yes. Uh, it, the oil company may be a little bit tempted to look at other concepts. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so from your experience looking and analyzing at uh, a lot of these FPSO companies, uh, what are the common difficulties or risks uh, of an FPSO project? Is it 
mainly anchored around technical or the financing, political risk, subsurface risk, you know, highly indulges. Okay. Yeah, I think the biggest risk for FPSO project would be schedule risk in late for first oil. So many, it's actually quite common for FPSO projects to be delivered late. So if your customer is not forgiving, you end up paying penalties or we call them liquidated damages for each day that you're late. So schedule performance has generally been poor across the entire industry. So if you look at the average FPSO projects, normally late by 100 days, uh, for their first oil. So let's say they promise to deliver it in April. It's actually quite common for the project to be delivered only around August or July. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about financing? Is it is it difficult for an FPSO? Yeah. Finance, financing is also a big hurdle for FPSO lease contractors uh, because FPSO lease projects are capital intensive. You have to pay for the FPSO upfront and you only get paid a couple of years later when the FPSO is operational. So it, the average uh, for some FPS, for the big FPSOs I mentioned, some of them can be as big as uh, $2 billion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, so FPSO leasing companies which are keen to grow will need to explore many ways to raise capital. So you can see some of these, some of the largest FPSO lease contractors out there exploring new ways to finance the FPSO instead of just borrowing money from a bank. Uh, for example, some of these companies are issuing bonds, forming joint ventures, or even exploring an IPO of their FPSO subsidiary. So... One FPSO, once uh, one IPO, but <laughs> life is only oh, right. even. Oh, no, right. uh, just, kidding. just kidding. Just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so, so probably an IPO of their FPSO unit, for example, if they are conglomerate. I see. I see. Yeah. So it doesn't get commingled, consolidated. You know, one this this division pulling down the balance sheet of this guy, uh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. On a related matter to that. Um. When we talk about financing size, so let's just say a uh, one billion US dollar FPSO project, right? Um, does it get like hundred percent finance, or is there like a mixture of uh the the less the less the leaser actually comes up with a certain percentage and and of their own financing, or what what have been the practices that you've seen so far? Yeah, usually borrowing money is usually usually a lower, cheaper form of raising capital. So companies will try to borrow as much as possible using project finance. Mm -hmm. So for $1 billion FPSO, it's common to borrow up to 75 to 80% of the capex of the FPSO. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then using the remaining 20%, you use your own money, your own equity. I see. And usually that 80%, um, I want to understand. I want to understand more about this thing called a counterparty risk. In the sense that, let's just say, let's just say company A lah. Let's not in any FPSO company, either Modek, SPM, or Insert, or Bumiada, right? Okay. So they go and approach a bank, for example, yes. and they say, "Hey, I want to borrow eight hundred million. I got this one billion US dollar uh, FPSO contract. I'll finance thirty percent. You come out eighty percent. Okay. So the ownership of that debt." sits on, let's just say, the FPSO uh, leases uh, balance sheet. But is there a possibility or have these leases actually uh, use strategies where the counterparty risk actually sits with the operator who is actually paying the leasing company uh, to get it off their balance sheets? Have you seen methods like this or strategies like this before? Yeah, usually the, the money that you borrow will sit on their own balance sheet, but okay. it's non-recourse to you. Okay. So, yeah. So meaning, if for some reason, uh, the FPSO is no longer is for some reason the FPSO is not producing oil, uh, uh, in or the fuel isn't uh, that has less oil than expected. Then in that scenario, the bank is only entitled to take away the FPSO. They they cannot go after uh, the actual company itself. Just like when you borrow money to buy a house, if for some reason yeah, you cannot pay your mortgage, the bank takes away the house, but they don't go after you personally. Ah, okay. That's a very good analogy because yeah. they cannot dig into your other wealth yes. because you are only collateralizing your house. Uh, yes. So, okay, okay. Yes. So, the terms being used are counterparty and also uh, non-recourse. So, 
let's just say, okay, let, uh, let's use an example. Uh, this is completely arbitrary. Let's just say Petrobras and probably uh, Yinsen uh, get into a contract and the project is financed 80% by an HSBC, for example, right? Yes. So let's explore the scenario where Petrobras just said, oh no, my subsurface data was completely screwed, <laughs> right? Yes. Not producing as much, my reserves are not as what I predicted it to be. Because subsurface uncertainty is a few hundred percent more fun sometimes, right? <laughs> yes. So then Yinsen is midway being paid, let's say third year, fourth year into the lease. And Petrobras says, oh no, I'm gonna I, I have to scuttle this project because it's not gonna make any money. Can Petrobras actually say, hey Yinsen, sorry, I'm not making money out of this, I'm gonna pull out the contract. And in this case, how how would the scenario play out? Can HSBC go? Let's just say HSBC sees the vessel from Vincent, but that also uh, uh, means that HSBC would have to look at Petrobras to, to pay back the remaining amount of money that you know um, Vincent took out for the loan to actually finance this project. Am I correct? So, so let's say um, a FPSO contractor signs a charter contract, the conservative FPSO lease contractor would make sure that the contract is written in such a way that if the fuel doesn't have enough oil and the oil company would like to terminate the charter contract, uh, in that scenario, the, the termination fee would be enough, would be equivalent to the revenues of the charter revenues of the FPSO. Uh -huh. so, so there shouldn't be a loss in this case, even if the oil company would like to terminate the contract. Yes. So the, the bank would have the bank would be sufficiently repaid. Okay. Uh, the contractor would, with the termination fee, the contractor would uh, get enough money to recover their profits even. So in a way, in a way, it's already very protective of the FPSO uh, uh, company, right? Maybe the the, the visa, right? Because it's like that's that's, yeah. that's assuming that the FPSO lease contractor is a conservatively run company. That that this is. Uh, they, they are not signing such uh they're signing a charter contract that protects their interests that, that is in their interests that's you raise a very interesting point being conservative yeah. right? Let, let's just say as an investor looking from the outside in right i don't think we are privy to uh the contracts being signed uh, for this right i don't think it's like fully divulged uh, publicly in an annual contract uh, in an annual report or whatever right so as an investor, what are the clues that you can pick up to determine whether a company is conservative, FPS or company is conservatively run versus that of aggressively run actually? Yeah, so that, that, that's a really good question. So you would want to look at the track record of the company. Uh, you, so if this is a company that has never won an FPSO contract before, then you might want to be careful uh, because this company might be taking on a lot of risks in order to get this new FPSO contract. But if it's a company that has um, been around, they've been doing many FPSO charter contracts, I think, uh, and you know that they have a long track record in delivering FPSOs on time, and uh, their FPSOs, once they're operational, they, they, they usually know um, operational problems or downtime issues, then you can uh, probably make the assumption that this, this company, this FPSO lease contractor is fairly careful with how they do things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. there are not many players, uh, I mean, left standing, right? I mean, a lot of companies have gone under because very high barriers to entry, high capex and all that. And then you just mentioned an earlier point, like even counterparty race and all that. In a way, the contract, if it's conservatively written, if the leaser, am I using the, the, the terms correctly, if the person who leases the company that leases wants to pull, the, the FPSO company that leases has written it in such a way that the cancellation penalty is more than sufficient to cover the cost of the entire project. So, but he just walks away with less profit, like, that's it, right? Yes. Yeah. So in a way, it's like kind of like ironclad, really, I would say. I mean, even if uh, the banks get protected because they get paid, because I don't think the banks are keen to take possession of an FPSO uh, that's not uh, being leased and sell it for scrap metal because it's like literally <laughs> the whole debt just goes down the drain, right? It's scrap metal. 
and obviously they want it to run. So then if I were to ask a question from that, then what would be the biggest risk in from this, this perspective for an FPS or company? Is it because it doesn't sound like if they take on too much debt and they have a track record of being conservative, it sounds like the contract in itself will protect all these debts, counterparty and, and, and you know, uh, yeah. Am, am yeah. I correct? Yes. yes, that's right. So for the lease FPSO contractor, if they are a proven contractor, they've been around for many years, they've delivered many FPSOs, usually what you want to be careful is that these companies will be uh, careful with how they take on new orders and when they are trying to grow, they don't take on too many FPSOs at one time. They're able to deliver on time. Mm -hmm. If you deliver on time, which is rare in this, in this, which is rare in this industry, um, mm -hmm. you couldn't be rewarded with more FPSO orders. I see. So I, see. I think one, one way I would look at it is to look at whether if this FPSO lease contractor has been delivering their projects on time. I think that would be a very important indicator of how well run the company is. Mm, okay, okay, yeah. Um, related to that, um, if an FPSO contractor, um, how, if they're growing very aggressively and sometimes at a certain time, I, I've seen FPSO companies that uh, are priced at two times book, <laughs> or they, they take on, they take on the, either debt equity or financing, uh, financing or debt that's like two, two, three times of geared up. So sorry, it's not book. Virtually geared two times, three times that of their, their whatever equity or that they have. Right? How will you know whether they they were too aggressive or too? Because you brought up a point about growing. Uh, gave you also brought up a point about if you have a track record will be rewarded but how do you know that let's just say i know sbm at one point of time uh they were getting they were getting more than they could shoot and because of that it worked into the delay of delivery schedule because amount of people resources they can pour into one project is very limited the, the talent pool is actually quite limited correct me if i'm wrong and you mm -hmm. can't like throw all these people building like like what Warren Buffett said, like you can't get a baby by making in one month by making nine women pregnant, right? So, <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? So I, I know I've packed a lot. So maybe how okay. do you know whether it's growing too fast and how do you okay. know whether yeah? So for me, uh, you know, I'm Singaporean. Singaporeans like uh, the three C's, you know, cash, credit card, yeah, uh, condo. <laughs> so. Uh, for me, the three C's that I would look at when I evaluate an FPSO lease contractor would be firstly, cash. I want to look at uh, consistency. And lastly, I want to look at uh, careful management. So firstly, cash. Uh, FPSO leasing is a very capital-intensive business. So a company which has less debt relative to equity will be in a good position to grow. So a company uh, which has a lot of net cash, for example, will, be, will also be in a great position to absorb many cost overruns. So you talked about what sort of metrics that we look at. Broadly speaking, uh, once the FPSO, all the FPSOs are producing first producing oil, you want to look at a net debt to equity, net debt to EBITDA uh, below three to four times. So that such a company should be well placed to grow. Uh, secondly, consistency. Um, the, like I mentioned just now, delays, losses from cost overruns are very common in the FPSO industry. So I think a best-in-class FPSO lease contractor will be consistently profitable over the last 10 years. Okay. So I would avoid uh, FPSO lease contractors which regularly incur losses and impairments because this is this could be a sign that they're having execution problems. Mm. And, Lastly, uh, just now I talked about careful management. Mm -hmm. So FPSO contractors, I, th I think as investors, uh, one way to evaluate that is to look at the date that the FPSO contractor would announce for their, the delivery date when they first secure a project. You want to see a management team which quotes an uh, achievable schedule to their customer. Mm -hmm. So an FPSO contractor which regularly delivers FPSOs on time will win more work. So uh, now also, I think this conservative attitude applies to how a contractor chooses to grow. So companies which gradually climb the learning curve will be in a better position rather than those which take on too many new things at one time. Uh, okay. For example, a company which usually builds only one FPSO at a time may get into trouble if they suddenly win four new FPSO orders. 
uh, similarly, a company which has never delivered a FPSO project in Brazil may be in trouble if they suddenly take on four new Brazil FPSOs at, in one, at one go. Mm. Yeah, I mean, great points about, you know, uh, the, the three Cs. Uh, I thought Singaporeans had five Cs rather than three. <laughs> 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 but anyway, jokes aside. Um, so I want to dig a little bit deeper about the um, probably the taking on of the balance sheet debt and all that kind of thing. I mean, um, some companies, uh, for the lack of a better word, sometimes they use a little bit of a creative accounting where they take on perps. Uh, and you know, perps sometimes get confused between equity and all that, right? And um, depending on who you ask, <laughs> some will say it's that, some will say it's equity, and it gets like hidden, obscure, and all that kind of thing. What examples have you seen? Um, and you may not need to name names. What examples have you seen of creative accounting within FPSO companies that have been to the detriment in a sense that they took on too much rights, diluted themselves, or they took on perps, whatever? And they took on this uh, massive amount of projects that they could not deliver, and then it was to the detriment, actually. A worst case scenario. So, with that, you know, when we build a mental model about what are the red flags that we should see, FPSO headed into the wrong direction, FPSO leasing company. Yeah, I think we want to be careful with uh, FPSO lease contractor, which has been reporting losses, and then the uh, that usually one loss leads to another loss. So, um, that so companies which have which are consistently profitable over a long period of time, let's say five to seven years, I think that's an indicator of a company which is careful mm -hmm. with how with their accounting, careful with how they win projects. Because I mean, you can be creative with your accounting, but uh, over a long stretch of time for five to seven to ten years, if you're consistently reporting profits and cash flow. It's, it's a good sign that your accounting is sound. Uh, you're careful with how you take on new FPSO orders. I see. Have you seen a net cash FPSO company? Oh. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm definitely not. Uh, I don't know whether you can surprise me. Uh. Yeah. No, yeah. I've never seen such. Yeah. But there, there are some large FPSO lease contractors which are not, not just, they're not the only one. They're not. Their business is not 100% FPSO, but FPSO is part of their business. So the, the other parts of their business is producing a lot of cash. So but even with such uh, big companies, they still have some debt on their balance sheet, some net debt on their balance sheet. Yeah, because I mean, just to take on a new project, it's already incurring debt, either debt or equity. Like, I doubt they want to give up equity, but maybe it's debt, right? Yes. Yeah, so like net cash, wow, I'm just thinking, I can't remember seeing one that cashed at the SO company before. Never, never seen one. So. Yeah, yeah. So do you, you do, do find one that we know? Okay, yeah, we want <laughs> to line up with that. So. <laughs> okay. So um next I'm gonna go back a little bit into um the technicalities of an FBSO and um it's just to give a, a little bit more flavor into the details about purpose build and conversion FBSOs. Have you seen that a uh, wrong strategy? Uh, that means they went for purpose built instead of a conversion, and because of that, they lost money. Or you see, like uh, they went for conversion, but the field actually outlasted that conversion life cycle. And then it actually have, have you seen extreme cases like this, uh, like those before, to use as an example to describe the pros and cons of each strategy? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I've. I've seen some examples where uh, FPSO company was, uh, there are new builds. So big picture, new builds make up around half of all the FPSOs out there. Okay. So, yeah, if we look at the rest are either tanker conversions mm -hmm. or redeployments. Okay. Yeah, so um, I've seen cases where an oil company chooses to use a tanker conversion or a relocation in the beginning because they're not so, this is a early uh, production unit. They want to see how well the fuel is producing before they commit to a, another bigger FPSO. So they, they choose a conversion or they reuse an existing FPSO first. And then after a few years later, if the fuel is producing well, then they send in a bigger FPSO, a new build FPSO or a conversion. 
Okay, so you see cases like that, just, just dip one toe into, dip one feet into the water first, then after two years, three years, oh, prolific production. Okay, come, let's go, all right? <laughs> uh, and what, what have been probably uh, scenarios, because I was reading with, uh, with uh, a lot of interest when uh, I think it was in since 2019 or 2020's report where they were actually eyeing a purpose-built FTSO called Nomura. No, Nomura, I can't even pronounce it correctly. And then they said that it's an, it's an expensive purpose-built FTSO and they were eyeing it because quality is high, was it the spec, obviously they didn't mention all that. And if they are eyeing something like that, do they already have another eye on that says, ah, this field very likely will be able to use this purpose-built FTSO. And that, that was the reason of their strategy for buying those like off the shelf that's already been built off lease. Is, is that the reason? Yeah, yeah. so the example you're you're using now refers to a FTSO redeployment scenario. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when a uh, oil, uh, oil company or contractor buys an existing FPSO and they modify it for the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so in such cases, usually you are very familiar with the specifications of this FPSO and you think that it'll be a good match mm -hmm. for the, the project they have in mind. I see. So that means for them to even execute or be eyeing on this already built FPSO, they must have already had like an identified project down the line that, okay, rather than I go and build a new one, this is like a very good redeployment or even a minor conversion to, uh, yeah. to deploy it. Uh, okay. I would think of FPSO as a pair of spectacles. So normally you, you don't just go buy a spectacle off the shelf and then think that it will fit you. So it usually has to be customized to you. Yeah. And then you want to be very sure that before you buy the spectacles that, you know, it's going to work, it's going to work for you. Yeah. I, I think I, I, I yeah. yeah, I love this analogies because uh, it gives uh, yeah. viewers outside of the, the industry uh, what what is it like, man? You know, especially you know the house one. You can only take the house, but I cannot take. I cannot touch the person. <laughs> okay. Um, you did mention um, earlier in our conversation that uh, conversion is usually two years. Purpose build it may even take up to uh, four or five years, right? Yes. Um, what I've seen um so far is usually even purpose builds get signed leases of like um seven years or even nine years. Um, very rarely I see 15 or 25, correct me if I'm wrong, straight, straight up after 15 or 25. It's usually like seven plus an option of five and things like that. What is the risk if we know that the payback period of the FPSO is only seven years? Is, is there a risk or is my data set that I just uh, verbalized to you wrong? That means what you see maybe is like straight up purpose built is a 15 year, 20 year kind of leasing. Yeah, usually for the big Brazilian projects, uh, if a lease contractor commits to a new build FPSO, they're usually looking at a charter period of 20 years. So they don't need to worry about the payback period mm -hmm. or, or the residual life, what happens after 20 years. Because usually after the, if the charter contract is a fixed period of 20 to 25 years, the useful life will be, the FPSO can be safely scrapped after 20 to 25 years. So they don't need to worry about uh, payback period and things like that. Mm. Yeah, so if, is there a ratio, a quick ratio to calculate like, um, let's just say, uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, okay, I, I shouldn't be quoting project names because I may get my numbers off, but let's okay. just say you read an FPSO purpose built charter, but only signed for nine years with an option under five, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a ratio to calculate the size of the project, let's say 2 billion, against uh, the duration? And most of the time, especially if they news, they will not give you the, the, the leasing rate. So maybe the question I'm trying to ask is that, can we do, or, or is there a formula to do some kind of a back of envelope calculation to know that when they're doing it nine years with an option of five, it's actually profitable to the company. I hope you understand my question. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. But usually the FPSO lease contractors will not disclose. Maybe they will give you the day rate, mm -hmm. but 
even if they give you the lease rate or the day rate, you you don't really know their operating costs. All right. So exactly. Usually, you're dependent on them giving you their projected rate of return. So, so yeah, it's, it's difficult for the outside investor to get a view on how profitable the contract is. Mm -hmm. So, and, and from the outside investor, I think the only way you can tell whether if you're in good hands it will be to look at the company's historical track record, whether mm -hmm. If they have been historically profitable, mm -hmm. uh, if they have been profitable over the last ten years, for every single year, then that's a pretty good sign that they are pretty careful management and they know what they're doing. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. So even to guys that like you guys sell side um, uh, analysts, uh, do they actually give you or divulge the information that you just mentioned that usually are not? Because usually do, they do give a little bit more information for institutional investors, right? Yeah, so for to in to in their investor relation deck, sometimes they may talk about the the return on equity that they expect, which mm -hmm. can be uh, anywhere from uh, eight to ten percent. So the yeah, so so they may give you a the a return on equity or return on capital, and that's that's the extent of uh, the profitability that you can expect I from see. a new order. Yeah, you usually don't get. Uh, a lot of details about how profitable the contract's going to be. Yeah. Because they, they know that their their competitors are watching. Oh definitely. So you kind of like for you to build your model, you kind of have to reverse engineer when they give you an ROIC, right? You kind yes. of have to reverse engineer and build that model yourself, right? Let's say day rate how much? ROIC how much? And then you build the model and say, ah okay, <laughs> this is where this is where the band Roughly this one, right? Usually they will disclose day rate. So you can look at the day rate and you take the day rate, you divide it by the oil process capacity mm -hmm. of the FPSO. Mm -hmm. or, and then you compare it to that, that allows you to compare the day rate across different FPSOs. Ah. So that will be an indicator of how uh, profitable the project is. So, for example, if you take the day rate and divide it by the oil process capacity of this FPSO for two Brazilian projects, mm. uh, the, the numbers should be fairly similar to each other. And if your day rate adjusted for size is higher, then that, that could be an indicator that this project could be a bit more profitable than the other one. You wouldn't run too far off right, from experience. Can... Yes. If it's for the same country, the same customer, it, it wouldn't be too different. Uh, have you, what's the biggest variance you've seen, same country but different operator have like certain operators because they're smaller, they give a higher rate. Have you seen cases like that? Yes, that, that could be possible. That could be possible. Lah. But usually, who pays better, the bigger operators or the smaller operators? Usually the smaller oil companies uh, would, would be a bit more willing to pay. Mm, because they want to, they, they the FPSO leaser also wants to avoid, uh, what do you call it, uh, want to be compensated for taking uh, risk. A bit more risk, yes, that's yeah. right. Okay, okay, good. Um, is there a huge correlation between size of project uh, to that of the day rate? Meaning to say a 1 billion um, FPSO project, roughly this is the band of the day rate. Uh, and is there a... a I'm guessing there's quite a good correlation between Yes, them. yes, absolutely. The, the bigger the capex, the higher the day rate. Okay, what's the most obscene day rate you've seen and what's the most like minuscule day rate you've seen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've seen, seen from memory, I think I've seen day rates that can go up above 600, anything above 600,000, US $600,000 per day is pretty high. Okay. Okay. Yes. The most minuscule one, uh, below below hundred k, is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. No, those those will be the for the very small FPSOs. Okay. And yeah. to probably for the benefit of the audience, um, a lot of assumptions, uh, especially those outside the industry, is that when oil prices are high, FPSO companies actually uh, uh, benefit directly. So maybe you, uh, could you take time to explain like. How is that model again, and how is it correlated or uncorrelated to oil prices? Okay, if you're FPSO lease contractor, the only way you can grow is usually if you 
get more, invest in more FPSOs and you have a bigger fleet of FPSOs. So in order for that to happen, you need oil companies to order more FPSOs. So that's where the correlation to oil prices come in. Uh, generally, when oil prices are high, oil companies will order more FPSOs. Yeah, so in a good year, uh, when you have 80 to $90 oil prices, you can see oil companies ordering 10, 11 FPSOs per year, but in a bad year when oil prices are low, uh, like say uh, 2016, there can be no FPSO orders at all. So mm -hmm. that's where we are talking about how oil prices can benefit uh, FPSO lease contractors. But it's important to note that in general, FPSO lease contracts are quite resilient. It's, it's not like the drilling market where uh, during an uh, oil price downturn, oil companies may cancel a contract with, for a drilling contract. Uh, generally, in the last few oil price downturns, oil companies continue to uh, honour their existing FPSO lease contracts. I think that's because oil companies are dependent on the FPSO contractor to generate income. So if the FPSO is not producing oil, the oil company has no oil to sell and no revenue. Okay. Um, yeah, so perhaps for the benefit of the audience, so when we talk about when Kevin was sharing about his um, day the day rates versus six hundred thousand to hundred thousand, uh, it's already fixed and baked into let's say a 10, 15, or even twenty year contract, and it has no correlation at all to an oil price at fifty dollars or hundred dollars. So let's just say Petrobras hires a Modec or an SPM, they pay them a lease rate, let's say a fixed rate of five six hundred thousand a day. But if prices are at $40 a barrel or $80 a barrel, uh, there is no change to that of the lease rate that is already signed. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, yes. Usually, FPSO lease rates are not correlated, are fixed prices. Correct. They are not correlated to oil prices. Correct. And have you seen contracts structured in such a way that if oil prices breach like 100 or 150, there's some profit share back to the leaser or I, I've not seen it, but I don't know whether you've yeah, seen it. Generally, the Malaysian FPSO lease contractors don't take on such contracts, but such contracts are more common in uh, the North Sea, in the UK, mm -hmm. yeah, where the lease contractors and oil companies have a, more of a partnership model where they, they share, the lease contractor is willing to take oil price risks. So when oil prices go up, uh, Oil, they, their day rate is higher. When oil prices are down, their day rate is lower. I see. Oh, but it's not like uh, above a certain threshold, then whatever profit is actually shared, right? It's just that the, the adjustment of the lease rate are based on oil prices. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So say maybe half of the lease rate is fixed. Okay. So let's say is 50K is fixed and the other 50K depends on oil prices. I see. I see. Okay. 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 Um, how do FPSO's company get penalized for downtime actually? What what have you seen uh, done before? Actually? Let's say I've not seen substantial downtime where you know uh, downtime is like 20% in a year. Uh, most of the FPSO companies I see is like 95, 98, 99%. But have you seen an uh, FPSO company operate so badly that the downtime is like 20% and if they do, what is the penalization uh, method actually? Yeah, the penalties can be quite severe, it can be zero day rate. So no day rate if your FPSO is not operational. So uh, FPSO lease contractors are heavily incentivized to keep the FPSO in tip top shape. It's always uh, ready to produce oil. Okay. And usually when the, the, is the FPSO is leased uh, to an operator, the crew and everything is actually paid for by the leaser itself, right? I mean, the FPSO companies itself, right? Yes, there are two types of contracts. So for the Malaysian FPSO contractors, generally they would do something called the time charter contract mm -hmm. where they would uh, provide the FPSO, they provide the crew, and they, they help to operate the FPSO. I see. I yes. see. And um, in elsewhere around the world, let's say Latin America or the North Sea, uh, is it still based on time charter or a different charter? Bad boat, you know, maybe explain bad boat, time charter, and yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, so there's this, the bare boat charter where the FPSO company would just provide the FPSO to the oil company and it's the oil company's responsibility to operate the FPSO and to provide the crew and to, to keep the FPSO in, in good condition. Including oil, including operation and maintenance, right? Bare yes. Is, yeah, okay. Yes, that's right. Uh, so usually for the FP, Malaysian FPSO lease contractors, when they take on contracts, they would usually take on time charter contracts. 
where they provide both the FPSO and also operations and maintenance. I see. And that's, uh, so right now, many of the Malaysian FPSO, these contractors are doing, uh, delivering Brazil FPSOs. So that's, those projects are normally done on a time charter model where they provide everything, the FPSO and also operations and maintenance. I see. So there's bare both, there's time charter. Is there any other kind of charters? Yeah, usually that's it. That's it, lah. Yes. And um, the ownership of the either the bear, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. Bear boat, the asset after the charter is complete belongs to the operator or the person who leases it, right? That's is that correct or is that like? Oh no, in both cases, ownership is with the FPSO lease contractor. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Is there any such charter where the final ownership of the vessel belongs to the person who leases it? Yeah, there are some contracts that are like this. So, for example, they in Guyana, some of the FPSOs are chartered on a two-year charter. Okay. And then uh, after two years, the oil company has an option to buy the FPSO from the from the FPSO lease contractor. I see. I see. Okay. And is that predominant or is that like a very rare outlier case for Yeah, that's, that's not common. I see, I see. Yeah. Because I guess a lot of these operators who lease these FPSOs, they don't want to deal with the, the scrap metal <laughs> at the end of 20 years, right? They just say, I'm paying you a rental, you settle all my headache for me, you settle the crew, and then I just want to produce the oil, am I correct? Yes, yes, okay. that's right. Okay, okay. Um. You brought up a point earlier about uh, drilling rigs are more, um, how do you say, the, the lease price or the rental rates are actually more correlated to uh, the volatility of the oil price. And you said that. Oh, I was referring to cancellation risk. There's a okay. higher risk that such contracts may be cancelled completely. I see. Uh, when, when oil prices are low. I see. Okay. Um, so am I correct to um, assume like, Let's just say like a day rate for a checkup rate, right? During the heydays of hundred US dollars a barrel, it can you know go up to probably three four hundred thousand a day, right? Yeah. But on a bad uh, uh, um, period, um, it can even go down to less than sub hundred thousand. Yes. Is the same volatility um, applicable to that of the FPSO leasing the band, or is it less uh, volatile in, in, in somewhat? Yeah, I think the the another analogy. Sorry, all these analogies. Oh, another no, no, no. way to, to look at it is so for drilling contracts, they tend to be think of it as a speed dating sort of thing. You know, it, they tend to be very short term, one to two year contracts. Mm. Yeah, so the day rates can go up and down a lot. But when you uh, enter, when the oil company enters into FPSO yeah. charter, Shut usually. Uh, think of it as a marriage. It's a long-term commitment. So the day rates, the charter contracts are usually for a long time, five, seven, sometimes 25 years mm -hmm. charter. So in, in that scenario, the, the charter rate is fixed, so it doesn't move around that much. I see. Yeah. Have you seen, probably in your years of you know analyzing the FPSO and energy markets, have you seen a decline of more than 30% between the lease rate? Uh, the reason why I'm asking is, let's just say someone builds a model for, let's just say, instance, they give you a day rate, 500,000 US dollars a day, then the ROI is roughly given, you reverse engineer, and you do a back of envelope calculation, and then all of a sudden, oil prices drop to like 40 US dollars a barrel, right? And then um, there's a provision in the contract that actually um, allows the visa, or the, the company that leases this uh, FPSO to actually reduce their day rate. Have you seen like a drop of more than 30% or even 40% of, you know, normal no. operating circumstance to, you know, so yeah. Usually the FPSO is purpose or customized to a single field. Mm -hmm. And it's quite common for the FPSO to stay there for its entire life and never, and, and you know, never leave the field. So. Yeah, it's it's actually the rare case where the the charter contract ends prematurely, and then the FPSO owner has to go around looking for a different contract. Uh, so, for from for perspective, um, only about twenty to twenty five percent of all the FPSO orders out there involve uh, reusing an existing FPSO. I see. Most of the time, you're looking at uh, a company ordering the FPSO for the first time. 
I see, I see, and I see. Okay, okay. Then this good perspective. That means seventy five percent of it are usually yes. purpose built. Twenty five percent are like off hires looking looking for a new marriage. Lah, put it this way. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um. Probably the last few questions. Um. One is where do you see innovation? Uh, for the FPSO markets. Uh, where do you, is it true? Perhaps the leasing strategy, contracting strategy, and where you see innovation in this uh, particular field. Okay, where do I where do we see innovation? Uh, I think it's mainly in how FPSOs are built right now. Uh, for example, you see this trend of standardized FPSOs, where some of the uh, companies, FPSO lease contractors out there, are trying to come up with a model to help oil companies deliver big FPSOs quickly. Mm -hmm. So they know that uh, some oil companies like Petrobras and ExxonMobil are going to need many big FPSOs over the next few years. So they offer a standardized FPSO concept. Like a modular uh, design or something like that, right? Oh yes, where the how is the same. It's, the, mm -hmm. it's always exactly the same how, a new built how. And uh, the only difference would be in the top sites and the mooring system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in some cases, some of the FPSO lease contractors out there are even willing to build the standardized hull on speculation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to, shorten the time, huh? to shorter the lead time and to gain an advantage over their competitors in for the these big FPSOs. So that's one of the more exciting trends you see in the market right now. Standardized new build FPSOs. Wow. <laughs> so it's yeah. like Buy, buy an FPSO with us. This is Lego set A, this is Lego set B. Uh, need play capacity 100,000 to 150,000. You go for this design, 200,000 and above. What's the biggest FPSO in the world today? Just curious uh, on the of that. With, I've seen FPSOs built at capex of $3 billion, where oil process capacity is more than 250,000 barrels per day. So those are very, very big. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Smallest one, 50,000. 20,000? It can be as low as 10,000 barrels per day even. Wow. Like those small <laughs> ones. Yeah. So just the variance is huge. Yeah. huge. yeah, yeah. Just for context, uh, I know some of you guys who are listening in are probably investors of uh, some oil and gas companies like this. So like the North Sabah fields, which is like 25 years old, that's producing a few thousand barrels a day. For those of you who are familiar with uh, companies like Hibiscus, yeah. So when you're talking about 250,000, I think Malaysia's one of the largest in Malaysia is uh, this project called Group Sukaka that's like 150,000. So we have 250,000, you're like, it's a few mongers, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. Mm, second last question probably is this uh, um, okay. with regards to an ideal FBSO company, so what are the things that tick your checkbox like? Okay, so you mentioned some of them, um, track record of profitability, uh, conservative management and all that kind of thing. But if you were to summarize it into a concise checklist, uh, what would you look at? Let's say, is it fleet size as well? Is it uh, um, um, the amount of projects that take on a year? Or, yeah, well, what is your checklist? Okay. Let's just say I show you a new, I mean, since there are not many players, but let's say hypothetically, I show you a new player in the market, it's probably got two or three FPSOs built. Okay. What would you know that these guys can, that this, this particular guy can actually reach the echelons of the products, the SPMs, the Unisons and all that? Oh, so this FPSO contractor has no track record. Yeah. They... Probably two or three, lah. probably deliver two or three. Yeah. Okay. If they have two or three existing FPSOs, I will look at firstly uh, their con their, their cash position, how much cash they have. Uh, secondly, I will look at how consistent they were in delivering the first two or three FPSOs, whether did they deliver on time, and whether they have been consistently profitable over the last few years. Yeah, and <laughs> lastly, yeah, also, yeah sorry, go ahead. So sorry, yeah. So if the guy has zero, let's just say let's let's. Let's let's take let's wind the clock back. Let's just say like someone like Vincent. I, I use Vincent is because they were never in the business, and then you know, comparatively to the Modex who were like shipbuilders, platform builder, Modex, SPM, and all these guys are like the the, the veterans, right? Right. But let's say someone new, someone let's say Vincent fifteen years ago, and they never 
were never in this business and all of a sudden they go out to the bank and say, hey, I want to be an FBSO contractor, right? Okay. So how will you take a bet on that? What are the things that you look at before you take a bet on that? Wow. So for how to evaluate a new FPSO contractor? Yeah. How, do you do, how would I do it? Yeah. I think first, firstly, I'll look at how big their new FPSO is. Okay. The first so one. This is their first ever FPSO. You want to see that they, uh, this, this isn't too big. Ideally, it should be below a billion dollars. So mm -hmm. okay. uh, even better, they're less than $500 million because this is their first FPSO. So secondly, I also look at whether they have a track record in this country. So mm -hmm. or, yes, I know they've never delivered an FPSO before, but whether if they have an existing business in this country, so maybe they'll be familiar enough with the regulations, how things work uh, when they're bidding for projects in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, I also look at whether if this company is has historically been profitable, no, no, uh, no big impairments. So that's an indicator of how careful this company is when they are taking on new projects. Understood. Understood. Yeah. yeah, because I'm just trying to like put in like a checklist for people who like, let's just say there's a new boy in town, right? I mean, if, yeah. if they had invested in Yen Sen, if I'm not mistaken, you would have gotten 83 times return, you know. <laughs> Those guys could like put in early, just saw something in the company. Obviously, yeah, Yitzhen is one example. Uh, but why I use Yitzhen as an example is because they, they were really a new boy, right? Uh, comparatively to the Modex, the SPM, the Fred Olsons, and all this, right? Yes. Um, MIC, yeah, they had shipbuilding experience. I think there was there was an additional advantage they had. They had a yard, right? But if it's so uh, attractive in a way to be an FPSO provider, why hasn't the ship just actually going into the weekend? Why, why isn't Samsung going into missing itself? Why isn't like uh, uh, even Hyundai, right? Uh, one of the fastest ship builders in the world. Why are they not underwriting these FPSO projects and missing them? Why, why do you think? I mean, I, have you wondered of that question? Yeah. It's a big chunk of it is constructed by them anyway. So, yeah, right. So, so firstly, this is a pretty tough industry. So as I mentioned just now, it's quite common for FPSOs to be delivered late. Mm. It's very common for FPSO contractors to lose money on FPSO projects. So from the outside, it doesn't look like a very attractive industry. Uh, so, so it's a pretty tough business, firstly. And there are not many companies that are able to do it well. Mm. So there are substantial barriers to entry there. And lastly, it's very capital intensive, like I mentioned. Uh, a big FPSO can be $2 billion. So mm -hmm. you, you need a lot of capital to grow in this business mm -hmm. if you're, you're keen to, to enter the FPSO leasing industry. I see. Okay. So um, probably the last, I just thought of two more, but okay, probably one of the last two sure. more questions. One is, does a particular geographical uh, position actually helps uh, give certain FPSO companies are laid up in, in um, being in this industry. Like for example, um, Nitsu is based out of Malaysia, um, Montec is based out of Japan, right? And, and the US, and then SBM is based on Monaco. Does these geographical locations actually benefit or do you see that there's no um, advantage at all uh, being geographically located? Because most of them, a lot of the FPSO projects are going to Latin America, I mean, or either that or West Africa. Right. So I, I'm just trying to pick your experience and, and, and your know-how on whether geographical uh, advantage uh, exists. Yeah. I guess it, yeah, I don't see a very clear geographical advantage. I guess it, it might help a little bit if uh, you, your, your main customers are European oil companies and you're based in Europe, then yes, it, it can help when you're trying to bid for a certain project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but generally I don't see a, a big, any geographical advantages there. Yeah, because if not then, yeah. I mean like, uh, we've been lucky, both you and I look at this industry and um, for those unfamiliar, you have actually platforms being built in, in Korea but actually it's for final deployment in Norway or final deployment in the US. Yeah. And um, 
if we were to follow that geographical advantage hypothesis, uh, the biggest market so far, correct me if I'm wrong, is actually Latin America for a lot of these uh, FPSOs. You don't see Modec uprooting themselves from Monaco, I know, sorry, SPM uprooting themselves from Monaco and going to Latin America, going to, let's say, Sao Paulo to set up a case there, right? Oh, do they? Do they do that? Have you seen that case? They have substantial operations there, but the execute the EPC execution is mainly done near the shipyards. Mm -hmm. So, uh, engineer, for example, engineering is maybe done in the uh, near their headquarters in Europe, mm -hmm. but the construction management is mainly done near the shipyards in either China or in Singapore or Korea. Korea, yeah, yeah. So it's really really global, lah. Where I think where there is, uh, let's say shipyards in China and in Korea, where they're known to be fast, they can get enough skilled workforce like welders and all that. They, they, rather than trying to move the whole thing over to a German ship, yeah, try to build it there, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably the last question would be this. Uh, um, yeah. How big do you think uh, the market uh, can cater? That? Oh, okay, maybe the, the other way I'll ask this question is, how many companies do you think can fit into this overall industry? Um, do you see one probably a consolidation or do you think that the players that they are existing right now is currently the right size for what you see as the demand for FPSO going forward? Yeah, I think the FPSO lease industry can probably... Consolidation seems unlikely because the biggest players are pretty... Uh, pretty large. So if you're looking at any mergers between the two, it will be a cross-border merger. It might attract antitrust attention. Hmm. So I think that, that could be. And for years, but on the other hand, for years, uh, many of the FPSO lease contractors have been incurring losses. Hmm. So so this is like the next few years could be a good opportunity for them to actually uh, start making decent profits now that uh, oil prices are high there are more fpso orders now and fpso contractors are getting busier mm -hmm. uh, but yeah there may be it's actually quite common for a new entrant to appear in the fpso market mm -hmm. uh, but they typically appear at the lower end of the fpso market so we're talking about 100 million dollar fpso not 1 billion dollar fpso Understood. for a first ever fpso Understood. Yeah. yeah because uh, yes. Yeah, in, in terms of new entrants, they normally take on the smaller projects. Okay, got it. So in a way, what you, if I were to conclude correctly from what I've heard, is like right now it's kind of like the right size, uh, Modek, SPM, Amumi Amada, MISC, etc. Uh, and you don't foresee consolidation because it's kind of like the right size, but you also do see like new entrants at the lower end. Uh, 100 million kind of size one, right? Yes. But usually, have you seen like the 100 million come in and how long do they normally last? And what is like, like the percentage of them like climbing into the big boys league? Yeah, you see companies that come one and then two years later, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite common for new entrants to fail in this FPSO market. So yeah. new entrants, that sucks. It's, it's easy to get a small FPSO, but there are substantial barriers to scaling up. I see. Yeah, I see. Okay, okay. Um, probably the last last question is that if you were to um evaluate the industry in five years, and you did mention about the innovation about um pre-built FPSOs, what in your opinion would be other things that you wish FPSOs companies would be coming up with? Either Financing a better financing strategy or a better uh, contracting strategy or probably just like can we even slim down certain FPSO but remain as efficient? I mean, from your point, of view, more of an outlook question. Huh? Mm, okay, yeah, I think one of the more exciting things out there for the FPSO market would be green FPSOs. Ooh, okay. FPSOs have a uh -huh. limit. Yeah have a smaller carbon footprint, FPSOs which uh, use energy from uh, offshore wind, for example, to power the FPSO, so they don't need to burn uh, gas to power the FPSO. So, or uh, FPSOs which uh, are very energy efficient. So, so this, this is the interesting trend right now, yeah. more green FPSOs. Okay. 
uh, I just realized how can I miss this ESG <laughs> <laughs> with with ESG now. I mean, I I mean, very humble and privileged that I get to speak uh, to some FAS operators um, and you know, kind of like ask them more personalized questions about ESG. Um, it's difficult to finance. I mean, with ESG breathing down the next uh, net carbon, you know, uh, zero goals. How do you think it will play out, and how do you think, um, you know, how much impact will ESG actually? Will they, they force FBSO players to be out of business entirely, or do you think that somehow or rather they will come to a consensus where, hey, uh, we do need net carbon zero targets, but then um, financing will have to be at a higher benchmark, higher cost, because ESG is also about cost. The more ESG compliant you are, the more cost. Are. So. What are your thoughts about ESG as a broad spectrum in terms of financing, in terms of you know getting projects off of uh, off the drawing board? Yeah, two things. Uh, firstly, I think with ESG, uh, you will need to oil companies focusing on their largest, most profitable projects. So that implies uh, banks, oil companies will be more focused on the biggest projects out there. So these are very big FPSOs uh, because they're very big. They are less vulnerable to oil price downturns. Mm -hmm. They have a low break-even oil price. So that will lead to um, companies which are able to deliver big FPSOs having a certain advantage. Because with a big project, you typically are less vulnerable to oil price downturns because your break-even price is lower. Mm -hmm. Uh, secondly, uh, with this or this focus on reducing carbon footprint, uh, green FPSOs are usually more expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, energy efficient uh, gas compressors are uh, heavier. It leads to heavier top sites weight. It leads to higher costs. So it leads to, in in general, it, FPSOs are becoming more capital intensive yeah, for the same amount of oil production capacity. So because of that, again, uh, that will lead to a FPSO lease contractors, uh, the bigger lease contractors having this advantage over the smaller players. Because firstly, you see that more of the bigger projects are making it to the finish line, uh, meaning the oil companies are only willing to move forward on their biggest and most profitable projects. And on the other hand, you also have FPSOs getting more costly, so you need to be of a certain size in order to finance such a big FPSO. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. It means yeah. survival of the fittest means scale, scalability, and you know, um, lower break even cost, uh, which comes with scalability. Uh. Yes. Great, great. Um, Kevin, it's been such a wonderful um, experience uh, learning about the FPSO market. Um, do you have any? last thoughts or wishes for the industry uh, even from probably uh, uh, the research part of it or even uh, certain companies that you're covering that you, you wish for them to be better any last wishes or last thoughts yeah, i think the exciting time for the fpso industry as we go through the energy transition so it'll be great to see uh, green fpso's having a very small carbon footprint and helping to contribute to net zero targets for oil companies yeah. It's an exciting time for the FPSO industry. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Th thank you so much for your time, Kevin. Um, so that was Kevin Sam, um, analyst uh, for a very large US-based, or is it, yeah, I think it's US-based <laughs> uh, research company uh, in the energy space. I hope you have enjoyed uh, that session as I, as I have. And um, if you like this kind of content, subscribe to the channel, give it a like. Hit that notification bell so that you know new episodes are out for you. And I'm looking forward to bring more experts like Kevin onto the show. Thank you again, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.